Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. She's had a photo spread in Vogue, been profiled and praised in Business Week. She's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. She's a banking and international finance expert. She's one of the 50 best dressed women in New York City, number 12, and one of the 50 most powerful women in New York City, number seven. She's Diana Taylor, and she's currently Managing Director of Wolfenson & Company, an international investment banking company. She's Chair of the Hudson River Park Trust. She's Chair of a Commission for the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation and serves on the board on several significant New York City nonprofits. Welcome, Diana. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Doug. I'm happy to be here. Okay, let's get it over with. Is he running or isn't he? Oh, well, you know what? I'm biased. I think he would be the best president this country had ever seen. But you know what? You should look at what he said and ask him. Okay. Very good. Let's go to the award you just received from the Citizens Union, the Civic Leadership Award. You're chair of the Hudson River Park Trust, and you give a lot of time to other civic and non nonprofit organizations. Let's talk about the trust first. The mission of the trust, its accomplishments, lots of stuff going on. Well, actually, it is an absolutely great, what it is is a park that's being developed on the west side of Manhattan along the Hudson River. And it was one of Governor Pataki's visions mm -hmm. as um, when he was governor. He was a great environmentalist. And <clears throat> the legislation was passed, I think it was 1997. And it's basically bringing the city back to the water's edge and giving people access to the Hudson River, which has not been there for a long time. And it's a not-for-profit, obviously. It's the construction part of it, the capital costs are being funded half by the city, half by the state. So it's totally publicly it's, funded. Yeah, it to totally publicly funded as far as the construction mm -hmm. goes. But in the, edu in, the, um, in the maintenance going forward, in the legislation, it says that it has to be totally internally funded. Mm -hmm. There will be no state or federal, or, or um, there won't be any How other How does money that happen? Coming. Well, um, the act grandfathers in a lot of commercial uses on the park. Pier 40 pays rent, mm -hmm. there's a big parking garage mm -hmm. there, the Circle Line pays rent, the Heliport pays Chelsea rent, Piers. Chelsea Piers. Right. Um, and so there are a bunch of concessions up and down the river that mm -hmm. pay rent. So the income at this point is about $13 million mm -hmm. a year and we've estimated we need about $20 million a year to keep the park up. But until that happens, all the construction is being financed exactly 50-50 by the state and the city. It, it's really magnificent. I've walked and I've, I've used it. It's unbelievable. And 17 million people a year. It's and, and, and you'll have more. It's just gonna it's just going to attract people because as you said, the waterfront was never accessible. You folks, there there's seven well there were really six segments and it begins with segment two and we won't talk about that because we have, can't figure out what that is. <laughs> You're reconstructing piers, you're building parks, there's dog runs, there's, it, it's different. It's, it's, it, it's it opens up. Yeah, and a lot of people can't understand why it's so expensive. It's going to end up costing over $300 million to develop it. And, you know, typical parks don't cost that much money. But this is an infrastructure project. You're talking about driving piles. You are building buildings on top of piles. You know, these old piers that were falling into the water. Pier 40 is going to cost an inordinate amount of money. The roof is falling in. So it's a lot more, you're, you're shoring up the, the shoreline, the um, bunkers along the shoreline, you're dealing with the Army Corps of Engineers and you know, all kinds of environment, environmental matters with DEC and regulations and that sort of thing. And it's really expensive and it takes a long time. Looking at sort of the, the at the governing structure, you are, you've got a, a board, but then you have a, a, an advisory committee. Talk about the, 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 you know, the governance of this. Well, the real governance of it is um, the board of the trust. Um, five members are appointed by the mayor, five members appointed by the governor, and three by the borough president. And you were appointed in the, the, this summer by Governor Spitzer. Right. 
which was interesting that the Democratic governor named you to, to chair this. That sort of signaled his commitment, given the fact that you really came out of the previous administration. Right. Well, I've been on the board for a long time. I've been right. on the board since 1998. Um, governor Bataki put me on it initially. Right. And Governor Spitzer asked me to do this last March. And I just I had just started a new job. I said, no, I'm too busy. And then he kept after me. And I finally said, yes. Because, you know, and I went over there a couple of times and I looked at it and I said, this is really worthwhile. And I think I can add value here. And I'm hoping that we can push through those final pieces of the project and get it done. And, and this could be done by 2010, essentially. Yeah, about 80 percent of it. There's some parts of it, about 20 percent, that probably won't be done by then because there's some city uses there. There's the little issue of the transfer station right. on Gansevoort Pier, right. which we're totally agnostic about. Whatever the state and the right. city decide get, to do is fine with don't, us. Don't get involved, <laughs> No, please. absolutely not. There are certain things that we do not right, get involved in. Right, right. This is state. smart Just policy. Just tell us what you want us right, to do. Right, right. Okay. So you've got that. Where does the waterfront go next? Well, there's um, a plan that's sort of in people's minds to hook all of these parks together, the Brooklyn Bridge Park and mm. Governor's Island mm -hmm. and the Hudson River Park and um, the West of Queens West. So, you know, there's sort of some ideas floating around about how to sort of link those together. Um, there's a great organization of all of the parks going up the Hudson River strung together, which are doing a great job. It's the Greenway. Oh, that's Just fabulous. fabulous. Yeah. And that's really the lifeblood of a city. I mean, can you imagine the city without Central Park? Right. Well, this is going to be Central Park on the west side. It's, it's about the same size. In some ways, it's better because the river is so right. fabulous. And kayaking and, and boating and sailing. There's so much going on. And on, yeah, and, and on top of it, the Jersey shoreline is getting nicer right. and nicer looking. Yeah. So you can look across that way and not right. you know, not, not look at the devastation. Right. Yeah, as a New Jersey resident, that's no, like, yeah, the, which, which <laughs> for is, you. Which is a plus. <laughs> This, the, the award that you got from the Citizen Union mentioned, mentions your efforts in a broad variety of civic associations. Talk about what else you're involved in. Well, I've always been really interested in women's issues and helping women um, in economic circumstances where they're not as well off as they might be. Mm -hmm. So I've become very involved with the New York Women's Foundation, which is probably about my favorite charity. It's great. It started about 20 years ago. And <clears throat> what we do is we raise money and give it to women's groups throughout the, throughout the five boroughs mm -hmm. based on you know low-income women, giving them the wherewithal to earn a living, helping girls, young girls, helping with security situations. We give money to organizations that help women who have been um, incarcerated mm -hmm. or family members have been incarcerated. We help with girls' development, education, dance classes, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. It's a great organization and it's come a long way and it's doing a lot of good and it's a great way to go and see New York too. What we do is we <clears throat> get proposals from about 100 different organizations in the city. And, and you we, have to go there. And we go there. We right. do the, deal, deal, the due diligence. We go on site, see the programs, meet the people. And you go to places in the city that even I had never been before, which is right. saying something. And, and, and you must be one of the better traveled New Yorkers given both that activity and walk, you know, walking around with the mayor. I mean, you've been everywhere. Well, I really shouldn't admit this, but. Okay, um, go ahead. Eight years ago, I had been to Queens to go to the airport. <laughs> My borough? <laughs> Your borough. Oh, man, right, exactly. that's great. But there's you, so you, much there. I know. It's I know. Great Starting city. with, you know, the, the museum there. I mean, don't oh, start me with that. it. Oh, it's fabulous. It's, it's fabulous. It's a resource, almost unparalleled. Let's, let's move to your, your, your paid work, your work with Wolfenson. You know, what do you, what do, you do there? What's the firm? Well, Jim Wolfenson started the firm a couple of years ago, as Formal you know. Former World Bank right, president. Right. He was the World Bank president for two terms, which is 10 years under both um, Clinton and Bush. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and he decided that he was going to, this is his second, I think it's, it's either the second or the third firm that he started. And we're a small sort of boutique investment banking firm. We do financial advisory work for some very large international banks. Um, looking at their international strategic position. And we're also raising a private equity fund, which you might think is a very interesting thing to be doing in this kind of an economic environment, but I'm glad we're doing it this year and not last year. <laughs> I think it's, um, we're in a much better position here. He knows people everywhere, mm -hmm. especially in the developing world, and we're raising money to invest in the developing world in green energy, alternative energy products, 
and financial services, which of course is right up my alley. Sure. And I just spent a couple of days a few weeks ago down in Colombia, which was amazing. There's so much going on. Yeah, you've been, yeah, I mean, you've been to Colombia, you've been to Kenya, you've been a, a, around, so yep, you've Russia. seen it on the ground how right. this is working. Is it working? How does it work? What, would, it what works. do we need in terms of national policy, in terms of your knowledge of what you're doing on the private end of it? Corn ethanol does not work. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so that's one thing that doesn't work. Right. <clears throat> you have to be sensible about it. And um, one thing that they've done in Colombia is they've created a, an environment, a regulatory environment, and um, a subsidy environment. It's not really subsidies, but a sort of incentive environment that really works and that incents people to do things that are actually in the best interests of the development of the industry as opposed to things that are Specifically? Well... <clears throat> They subsidize the um, corn ethanol industry. I'm not corn. I'm sorry, cane, sugar cane. They have the best place to grow sugar cane, I think, in anywhere in the world, really, when you get right down to it. Um, and they give rebates to people who buy the corn, eth the um, cane ethanol. Mm -hmm. And they have a rule where 20% um, of all of their fuel has to have be ethanol. Right. And they're going to be raising that. Um, as time goes on. What, what can we learn? You do a lot of work in the developing world. What, what can we learn from them, we meaning the United States in particular, in terms of these types of development policies? Clearly they're transferable. Uh, they are and they aren't. One thing that we can learn is that one size does not fit right. all. Okay. You have to go to the country, you have to talk to the people, you have to see what works, you have to see what's worked in the past, what their customs are, how they live, and then you can figure out how you can help them. Mm -hmm. And it's mostly from the ground up, not so much from the top down, I think, anyway. Um, and that's how you approach it in, right, in the that's farm. It, right, exactly. And another thing I've gotten really interested in is microfinance, which is a fascinating field, and that was basically started in Bangladesh by Muhammad Yusuf Yunus at um, Grameen Bank. Um, about 20 years ago, and he gave small loans to very poor women, and they built their little businesses, and they were able to feed themselves and their family and their children. And it was incredibly successful. There's another organization there called BRAC, which was um, started by Dr. Abed, which basically did the same thing. But what he did was he brought in not only the access to financial um, wherewithal, but also health care and education. So he's really created sort of a holistic structure, which seems to work really well. And the fascinating thing about that, I'm on the board of um, BRAC USA. So. You can keep going. Go ahead. <laughs> um, the fascinating thing about that is you have a country like Bangladesh, which is one of the poorest countries in the entire world, and they are exporting this model to Afghanistan. They exported it to Sri Lanka. Um, after the tsunami, they have exported it to Africa. They're starting operations. It sounds like it could be exported to, to New York State. Right, exactly. Yes. In fact, yeah. it, it somewhat sounds like the 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 initiative to pay folks to do positive right. things right. Exactly. from the Mexican experience. Exactly, and it's all about trying different things, being having the courage to try different things. And, 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 and they don't work, then doing something else. But if you don't try it, then and in you part, being good capitalists, providing financial incentives to do good right. behavior. Right, And being exactly. rewarded for those behaviors. Exactly. Is New York City, the big question has been, is New York City in, in danger of losing its preeminence as a global financial capital? And you've, you've looked at New York vis-a-vis -vis other, other areas, obviously in both your public roles and your private roles. How much of this is hype? How much of it is real? What are the vulnerabilities? Um, we're nervous. I, I think it's a very good thing to be nervous. Oh, God, it's that's very, not good. No, no, it is good. It is good because if you're a little bit nervous and you've got the adrenaline going, then you're going to be working really hard. And one thing that will kill us is if we stop being vigilant. Okay, and what, what does that take, mean? If we what take do we got to do? We have to, well, I think that we have to do what the city's doing, which is make it safe. It's extremely safe. People want to live here. The schools are good. People want to live in New York. You hear of a lot of people coming here to live. You don't hear of a lot of people leaving to go live somewhere else. So I think the main thing that the city can do is make sure that it's safe. And that's something that the city has control over and the school systems. 
The next thing is the regulatory climate, which is a little bit of a different story. We don't have a lot of, con New York City itself right. does not have a lot of control over the regulatory climate. But I think that the city is doing what it can itself, you know, building parks, making it a great place to live with the, you know, cultural institutions, mm -hmm. as I mentioned, schools, it's safe to walk around the streets. You know, you hear about other cities and, you know, there are all kinds of stories now coming from London and other places that people are afraid to walk around at night. That's not true here. And that is the biggest. Is there, is there, are there fiscal or financial things that we have to do as well? well I think we have to be careful about our tax structure, um, how much we charge in tax-wise. Mm -hmm. But then on the other hand, you know, you might have very low taxes, which is very attractive, but then you can't pay your police officers. So you have to weigh, you know, what are you willing to pay for right. in order to make a place a better place to live. So, and I think that we've got a pretty good balance here. Okay, let, I want to step back a little bit in your days as New York State Banking Superintendent. Um, that was a great job. <laughs> you, can, you know what? You can tell. That was a great job. You can tell that job. you love this job. <laughs> I did. I mean, I, I did. as I told you off camera, I've read, you know, I'm probably the only person who's read your last six speeches as as uh, state banking Did superintendent. I say that much? Wow. Well, there's four of them there because I only took notes on four of them. But you can see I I, I highlighted, I underlined. Mm -hmm. Business Week Perfect. characterized you as a street savvy bank cop. The subheadline reads: New York State Overseer Diana Taylor is fiercely focused on protecting consumers. When you walked into that job, what did you what did you find? What did you find the most appalling? What did you find <laughs> left you scratching your head? And what led you to, to just move forward? <sighs> That's a big question. Um, well, let me tell you, right after I started, I'd been at the banking department for about a week or two. This was in summer of, I guess it was 2003. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I really shouldn't admit this, but I'd been an investment banker as a background, and so I didn't really know all that much about commercial banking regulation, and I barely knew that you know there was a federal charter and a state charter. So the learning curve was pretty high. Um, Governor Pataki asked me to take this on, and I said, okay, fine. And then I went and started reading, and I'm like, oh, my God. Well, I started <laughs> anyway, reading this, right, and I said, exactly. oh, my God. Anyway, so I'm down in Washington. I'm having a meeting with some people, some fellow regulators, just sort of getting acclimated, and I got a call from the office from these people who I'd been working with now for two weeks, and they said, well, something just happened. I said, well, what's that? And they said, well, the controller of the currency has just issued a notice of proposed rulemaking, which is sort of regulatory speak for, you know, we're going to issue this new regulation, basically preempting. I wanted you to talk about that. Go right. ahead. Basically preempting all state um, lending and depository laws, which is basically gutted consumer protection at the state level <clears throat> for nationally chartered banks and their subsidiaries. Well, and I said, that doesn't sound good, does it? <laughs> and they said, no, it's not very good at all. I said, good, well, we need to say something about it and you know, issue a press release or something saying, this is terrible, we're not going to stand for this, what about the poor consumers? Well, it, and you see, I won't say that that has been, was the direct cause of some of the problems that we have now in the subprime mortgage area. Right. But I think that it was a contributing factor. And one of the things that I was I fought for the whole time when I was banking superintendent was we need national a minimum national laws having to do with consumer protection and how we look at mortgages. Because depending on what state you're in or where you are, you can have different laws. And the main thing that was wrong with I thought and then, anyway, I thought with this preemption was you can have two banks right next to each other on Main Street. You can go into one bank and, you're, and take out a mortgage or a loan, and you are governed by an entirely different set of rules than if you go across the street. You're you, as Joe Consumer, do not know that. And I was sitting at about that time at a dinner party with somebody whose name everybody would know, which I'm not going to say, who's very financially savvy. And we were talking about this question. He said, oh, that's not a big deal. You know, everybody knows whether their bank is nationally or state chartered and what it means. And I said, excuse me. No. I said, okay, so do you bank with a nationally or state chartered bank? And he said, I have to bank with a state chartered bank. And I said, which one? And he said, city. And I said, city is a federally chartered bank. Okay, I rest my case. <laughs> You made a friend. Yeah, yeah well, anyway, <laughs> I did not rub it in. Okay, so you have this preempt, but first of all, you have this dual banking system. I, I mean, I just learned this stuff, mm -hmm. so it's bizarre. 
Oh, it's totally and then bizarre. you noted in one of your speeches that no sane person would put together this system. And it sounds like being you know, a political scientist, Jefferson, Madison, and Hamilton had this argument about who's chartering banks. Right. Well, you know what? One thing to say about that, though, and another problem that I had with the actions of the control of the currency was this is a system that has worked very well. However it's worked, it's complicated, it's difficult, but it has worked for a long time, and we have arguably the best financial system in the world. You know, people have access to credit, people can start businesses, for the most part. I mean, there are obviously always people who are going to be left behind, and you work to solve those problems, but for the most part, the system works. And then for, for somebody or one agency to come and sort of tinker around the edges with that, just unilaterally change the whole thing without really discussing it with all of the you know, various and sundry stakeholders involved, I think it's really dangerous. Mm -hmm. and, if you're gonna, and I'm not saying that it shouldn't be changed. I think it should be changed. And this is something that might not be particularly um, palatable to a lot of people. But I think that um, you know, the Federal Reserve and the federal regulators should do the money, the regulation as far as the, you know, reserves and, you know, that sort of thing, capital requirements and all that sort of thing goes. And the states should do the consumer regulation mm -hmm. because it's the states who really know what's going on right. in their states. And there ought to be a floor mm -hmm. so that everybody's working from the same book. Now, with this, with this preemption, uh, banks then had the ability to opt either for a federal or a you lost two major banks, J.P. Yes. Morgan well, Chase that's and another... HSBC, and which is right. which was a big chunk of your income. Right. Well, one thing about the banking department, which is very interesting, which people don't really understand, is that it's a totally self-supporting agency. We do not get any money at all from the state coffers. Every cent that we get, we get, or the banking department gets from assessing at the institutions that it oversees. So that was sort of the first thing I thought after you know, hearing this news, thinking, hmm, you know what, J.P. Morgan and HSBC do a lot of business across state lines, so they're probably going to be thinking pretty hard about changing their charters. And they did, and that took 30% of our revenues. And think of this as a businessman, 30% of your revenues go away, but your variable costs for regulating these institutions is virtually de minimis, right. because these two very huge institutions were um, supporting most of the activities sure. of the banking department, sure. because the banking department oversees 3,500, give or take, financial institutions in the state of New York, which includes about 300 banks, give or take, over 2,000 mortgage brokers, you know, 300 mortgage bankers, check cashers, money transmitters, you name it finance companies and that sort of thing. The, when I got there, the only institutions that were being charged an assessment were the banks. Right. So they were subsidizing everybody else. And the big banks were subsidizing little banks. So we had a serious problem. So one of the things I'm proudest of doing <laughs> at the banking department is changing the assessment structure so that everybody is mm -hmm. assessed. And each department is, you know, is getting there. It's more or less self-sufficient. Right. So the revenues from their regulated entities support the operations of that department. And that's what we are moving towards. You, you were very critical of the Security and Exchange Commission, as, as was uh, the Attorney General, uh, now Governor. You said that they did too much interested in getting malefactors after the fact and not enough on prevention and, and, and consumer education, which was one of your big things mm -hmm. as banking superintendent. Yeah, an educated consumer is one that's probably not going to be as easily ripped off. And that was the whole thing with the mortgage, the whole mortgage crisis. Oh, some I, of the stories are just horrifying. It must be unbelievable in terms yeah. of the, the human devastation, as well as the, 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 the systemic fiscal impacts, right. if you will. Well, the systemic fiscal impacts are really quite severe, and you have a lot of cities, especially in upstate New York, where you know you have one or two houses that go into foreclosure, and the entire neighborhood goes yep. down yep. because nobody's yep. keeping up yep. the property values. And you can say, and there's an argument, which I'm very sympathetic to, you know, you take out a mortgage, You've got to be an idiot to take out a mortgage now for, you know, like a teaser rate of 3% or 5% right. or no interest or whatever. That's going to go up to something, you know, huge. Astronomical. Like, right. You know, prime plus whatever five years from now. But the problem is that a lot of time this is not disclosed right. to the consumer. Sure. And 
it's just horrifying because you look at the evidence and a lot of times it's you know it's the very it's the poor and the minority populations and the immigrant populations that are really preyed upon on this and there was a woman who came into my office about you know a couple months after I started and she had maps she was a consumer advocate she's great she had these maps city of New York overlaid on that she put low-income areas you know shaded low-income areas on top of that she put where um, foreclosures have taken place and they're all in the you, you can guess, you can guess. Right. and then on top of that she put a map of where bank branches are and they're not there and they're not there and you, really you dealt with that as, yeah, and as, we tried to deal with that with the um, banking development districts which I think is a great program because a lot of the time it's interesting the problem with in the mortgage market is not so much with the mortgages that are originated by the banks they're mortgages that were originated by mortgage companies. And they're the ones where, you know, a lot of the time you just don't know, you know, where it's coming from. And then the mortgages get split up and sold out into different portfolios. Complicated. And You're going to have to really come back and explain this because okay. we only have a minute. Oh, no. <laughs> and in the last minute, we've got to do Vogue. <laughs> the famous Vogue spread with titled A Cool Charisma. From City Hall to from Wall Street to City Hall, government financial whiz Diana Taylor brings patrician elegance to the world of business dressing. How did my you mother get, would love that? How did you get a spread <laughs> with and the same issue as Beyonce Knowles, Sarah Jessica Parker, and Diana Taylor, who looks fabulous? There's Catherine Hepburn here. How did you? Do, how did this happen? Um, Anna Wintour called me up and asked me to go to lunch, and I did. And she said, "Would you, would you do, you know, an article? Can I send somebody around and do an article?" on you um, in Vogue. And I said, well, are you kidding me? Me? Um, but, um, yeah, so I sort of thought about it and um, said, fine. And, <laughs> it was and, really and, fun. And you've never regretted it. It was so much fun. Well, I was, I've been very lucky um, <laughs> in, um, I think. But anyway, uh, it was fun. It was really fun. I mean, imagine walking into a room full of clothes that fit you and all you have to do is put them on and people... It's a lot of work, though. I, I have a lot of sympathy for models. It's a lot of work. And you do feel like a slab of meat after a while, <laughs> being poked and prodded and singed. Did you ever and... look back? No. Okay. No. But, well, we have, to look, we have to look ahead. You have to come back because this half hour flew, and I've got two pages worth of questions. <laughs> so you promised to come back. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email. Whatever it is, thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it. Send it.